further ado, we're going to get going pretty soon. I just, I'm just glad you're all here in this room. This is the room. I think all the talks are going to happen here. So now we this. That's great. Uh, the only other thing that you need to know while you're in the Centre for Mathematical Sciences is that we're going to have tea and coffee uh, after we've had two talks, and uh, that's going to be upstairs in the court, right in the big, big, big area. And lunch will also be up in the core as well. That's coming after the third talk. And then before the last talk, there'll be more to So that's all the good news. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, more complicated, boring things about plain forms and things. Uh, so we're going to start. Okay, we're going to start with double brights. <laughs> <laughs> well, next we'll, we'll start with, with Marcus's first talk of the mini course about uh, semi hunters. Uh, thank you, Henry. It's a pleasure to be here. I just gave my awkward thoughts for this. So I'm a bit nervous about this stuff. I'm not usually nervous about speaking. Um, but uh, Henry essentially asked me to give you a history lesson, I think, uh, which is, well, well, he actually said, is, What did you guys actually do in the 90s? <laughs> 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 And so, so I've been reading, and so, so I'm slightly nervous about this, because you know, normally I can give a lecture, you, know, you read a couple of papers, or you, you think about what you've been doing recently, you give a talk. I've been reading stacks of papers to see what we did do in the 90s. And I'm going to try and organize it into some coherent account. Um, but, uh, well, I thought I'd do that this weekend. It didn't quite cohere as much as I expected it to, but uh, we'll see what happens. So I'm also writing some notes. So uh, a lot of things that I just wave my hands at so, um, so, I thought I'd start by, uh, so I was reading uh, the, the talk I gave to the ICM in 2006, which has a lot of this in it. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a good reference to start with, actually. That's a paper called uh, um, Curva, Non-Positive Curvature and Complexity for Finite Representative Groups. It's in proceedings to the ICM, the Madrid ICM in 2006. And, I, and a lot of the story I'm going to tell is in that. Um, now, uh, I sort of said, I, I sort of said, well, everybody knows this, and Henry pointed out I'm extremely old, which I haven't <laughs> <laughs> and so not everybody knows this anymore. And so, uh, forgive, forgive me if I'm telling you things you learned a long time ago, but hopefully I'll put it together in some sort of coherent account. And so I'm going to start by sketching uh, the universe of finite presentation. Because you can't understand finite representative groups, there's all sorts of undecidability phenomena. phenomena. But I, I kind of find it useful to think of this picture where you sort of think to yourself, well, what, what if, if I set out without any prior knowledge to, to prove something about finite representative groups, how do you sort of start? Well, you sort of start with the trivial group, which I draw as a big fat point, because uh, every kind of draw you think of commensurable groups being the same. So you think of things up to commensurability, which means the whole finite group theory goes back. Okay? Um, then there's a gap, and then you start thinking about infinite groups, and it's an obvious first infinite group, so that's that Z. And then it's not so obvious what comes next. Right? If you think in an abelian fashion, well, I was thinking this sort of talk for years before I realized that the colors of political parties are different in North America. <laughs> in Europe, blue always means conservative. Um, uh, so so if, if, you, if you sort of start on the conservative wing of the, uh, the universe of groups, the sort of calm, uh, civilized, respectable thing to do is to start taking direct products. Right? And so what comes next is uh, be a being group. So if you're thinking topologically, what you just did is you're thinking about spaces and fundamental groups, and the first thing you think of is a circle, and then the next generalization you think of are, are higher dimensional torus. <coughs> but equally, if you, get, if you ask a child, if you give them a few circles and say put them together, they don't take a direct product, they take a free product, right? they, just, they just bash them together. And so, if you're thinking more freely, <coughs> what comes next are, are the free groups. Right? Now, they're all commensable as well, but somehow, just for emphasis, you draw them a slightly bigger region. And then, what, and then, then what? Okay, so you get the hang of free products and free groups and free abelian groups. 
And then it, down this side of the universe, it's kind of completely clear what comes next. It's Milkovkan groups. Okay, so you have the free being groups, and you have the Milkovkan groups. Why do they come next? We all. So, so if you try to sort of generalize a being in any sensible way, what you come up with is, is an opotent, right? So you give up a little bit of, a, of being obedient, then the sort of least you can give up is you say, well, let's say all commutators are central. And then and you go a bit more and a bit more, and that gives you obedient, right? If you think geometrically, then, you know, so why, why is one of the calm things about obedient groups? Well, it's just your cooking specs. Balls just grow in a polynomial fashion. Okay, so you think, well, what else will keep me from having to drink too much alcohol in the evening? I'll just, you know, just pick what grows polynomially, and then famously it's, it's no potent groups. Right? So somehow, no matter how you think, if you're thinking reasonably, no potent groups come next. And then well, things like polycyclic groups and, and solvable groups, and uh, more generally and elemental <coughs> amenable groups. And all of this is down the amenable side of the universe. Right? Somehow the key key property that goes down that line of thought. Okay? And then, so the other coast of the universe is the non-positive curve side of the universe. Here we have non-positive curvature. And we sort of know the way this begins. Right? So you've got three groups, and you had a lot of fun with three groups, and then, um, so, so it's now pretty clear, if you try to generalize Three groups as, 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 as little as possible as it were, talk about approximately three groups, what you'll end up with is the limit groups, or fully residual three groups. And that's it. That's, I think that's a, that's a quite good number of years in my life thinking about this. So if you try to think about the generalized three group, you try to relax the definition of three group in any way, like say you take a Gromov Hausdorff limit of a point of three groups, or you you think of things that have the same first order logic as free groups. Think in any sort of reasonable way about what's an approximately free group. One of the great things about limit groups is, is that's, the, that's what you arrive at. Okay. So if this was a longer series of lectures, I'd spend time talking about limit groups. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about limit groups. And then, of course, most famously, you come to hyperbolic groups. Okay. Again, this is sort of an inescapable definition. Right? You, you sort of know when you're doing something good in mathematics, but when, when you, you think, well, I'll, I'll perturb that definition slightly, and you find out it's equivalent to the one you started with. And in most reasonable senses of, you think about approximating negative curvature in group theory, you'll come to hyperbolic groups. So I'll talk a little bit about, about exactly that thought in a minute. And then what? Okay. Well, uh, well then, we sort, of, we sort of love, uh, uh, now I don't know how to do this. <laughs> so now, now you sort of get to complicated lines. So now you start talking about, well, we also love cat zero groups, okay? By which I mean, okay, groups that act properly and co-compactly. These uh, are the paradigms. So, first of all. So in the background, three groups, but that, that's, that's sort of in, in, in our infancy. So there's a few hyperbolic groups. And next to that, there's, there's, there's what I resisted calling cat zero groups for years. So that's what you have to okay, okay. So that is this gamma. So it's uh, where x is a uh, say proper. That's an x. Is So, if we're in the torch of free case, then we just talk about fundamental groups of compact non positive curved spaces, but we want to allow torsion, so we can think about all, all, all these goals or all these spaces. Okay. Uh, and we still don't know, for example, so why did I wiggle this here? You know, because there's still one of the things about drawing this picture of the universe is. Well, you wonder, are all hyperbolic groups cat zero? We still don't know that. So, uh, I, feel, I feel surprisingly today and tomorrow, and you end up saying we still don't know that quite a lot. 
Um, and it's surprising just you know, how many questions were left unanswered in, 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 in this sort of general area of mathematics. Um, there continues to be progress, but uh, now that this is a rather complicated picture I'm holding my hands, and so you can all go and look at it. Given the joys of edgy room, you can all be looking at it right now, for all I know. Um, but, but then the question is, what comes next? Okay, so that's what I want to talk about. So there's a theory of, <coughs> of semi-hyperbolic groups. Um, now, there's a definition of a classical semi-hyperbolic groups, which I'll get to. Uh, but also, there's, there's a chapter in Gromov's essay, in, in the book Essays on Group Theory, where he first introduced uh, hyperbolic groups, where he has a, a section on semi-hyperbolic groups, where he more or less just sort of expresses some feelings about it. Uh, and then he has a more in-depth chapter in his book on asymptotic invariance of groups. Okay, so see a Gromov in, in both his essays. So, so the one on hyperbolic groups, One that's in essays in group theory. And then, uh, and also at the bottom there. Uh, I actually, I, I came across yesterday, I came across a quote that I'd forgotten. Hyperbolic groups that, 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 that I'm sure you all tried to read. Uh, <laughs> um, on, on page 81, he says, states, non definition. A group is called semi hyperbolic if it looks as if it admits a discrete co compact action on a space of non positive curvature. <laughs> so that's, that's, oh yeah, that's so good on the way. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> off in 1987. Any of the stories, so it's non definition. Uh, a group is semi hyperbolic if it looks like. And this is what we've got to decide. Okay, well, what does this look like mean if it looks like it looks as if it admits. Uh, 
it begins with uh, with, with the conversations um, of Jim Cannon. Jim Cannon, that's it, Jim. That's Jim Cannon and Bill Thurston um, on the algorithmic properties of primary groups. And I'm going to introduce that. Uh, I'm going to introduce the automatic group in exactly that way. Okay, by sort of retracing what these conversations were and, and how they would use the theory of automatic. And Cannon had also been thinking about what a negatively curved group should be. Right? He has a beautiful unpublished research <coughs> called Negatively Curved Groups, uh, in which he sort of independently discovered much about uh, hyperbolic groups. Didn't get as far as Romov, but he discovered a lot of it, and particularly he was concentrating on algorithmic properties, but he also, uh, he, his starting point, he told me, was trying to think about Dane's algorithm, in which groups have a Dane algorithm, okay, which leads you one definition of hyperbolic groups. Um, and because he'd been thinking about this, he was actually the referee. This, this is supposed to be secret, never mind. Uh, he was actually the referee of Gromov's essay on hyperbolic groups and spent a long time trying to understand this, you know, pages and pages of notes. And, uh, and Misha said, said, well, please thank the referee, I'm not making any changes. He <laughs> gave us all lots to do. Right, so Cannon somehow is a name that should not be forgotten in this whole story because it was extremely important. Okay, and then there's various relaxations down here. There's things called cohomal groups, and uh, and and various generalizations that I'm going to talk about down here. Okay, and so and, and then these lines go off here. And there's a question about how classes intersect and so on. That's why I like drawing these pictures of the universe. Uh, and so, what, what are the fundamental questions, the basic questions we're asking here? Basic questions. Is, so, a question which in different forms has sort of kept coming back in group theory uh, and, and has found nice answers in different contexts. So, what are useful um, uh, uh, or natural? Definitions <coughs> that capture uh, some of the essence of so various weak forms of negative and positive. I guess this is, is this is the beyond hyperbolicity bit. Okay? So there's many things. So, so I'm going to talk about these definitions here, which all have a particular theme in common, which will come out. Okay? But then you know, there's the CF lots of other stuff, right? So you know, what's proved to be a very successful theory is, is relatively hyperbolic groups, asymmetrically hyperbolic groups. Which I, which I personally think is uh, absolutely the right definition for many things, etc. But I'm going to talk about a particular part of this story, and that's exactly really how these things were thought of in the 1990s and a particular approach to this question. Okay, so that's really well, that's the question I want to get at. The paradigms are, are these hyperbolic groups and cat zero groups. And then what are you trying to do? So, so, so we have a lot of basic questions here. So, 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 so meta question one. So what are the weakest hypotheses to make um, useful or attractive theorems true? Things that we know and love about hyperbolic groups, 
or cat zero groups, take them, think about what really makes them true, and we try and weaken the definition so you get true in a larger, larger um, class of examples. Okay, so we want theorems, want your favorite theorems, nice theorems. Uh, uh, are nice theorems are true in large classes of groups. And I really want to start on large, okay? Large classes of uninteresting groups are by definition uninteresting, okay? So in particularly geometrically interesting. So, amongst our paradigms, okay, we have these classes of groups, hyperbolic groups and cat zero groups, but we also sort of have the gems of group theory. Right, so things we really care about. And so, I think in, in most people's mind, for example, three manifold groups, one kind of group of compact three manifolds, lattices and semi simple E groups, so say lattices and connected E groups. So, as I, 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 put, I went weak there and said connected Lee groups, and I said mill potent Lee groups. So, mill potent groups are interesting for many reasons, okay, so I put those. But also, so particularly lattices and semi simple Lee groups, things like S, L, and Z. Okay, let's crop up all over mathematics, and these, these, there's all sorts of reasons to be interested in them. And then, one of the other groups that we just can't help caring about mapping class groups. Uh, and then lots of care about out of FN and all to that So, okay. so of course, when people are talking about the richness or, or the niceness of what they've done, they quite properly focus on how much can you say about these classes of groups. For example, I think in contrast to, to the things I'm going to talk about, one of the great attractions of the asymmetrically hyperbolic groups theory is the fact that it does include so many of these groups that we really care about. I can also put random groups there, so that's, that's a different sense. So that's the first kind of question. So just the struggle to weaken definitions and keep the theorems. Um, and then I have a second point that's so important to talk about. Uh, what's, the other, what's the other thing I wrote for myself? Uh, that's ridiculous, I've actually forgotten. <laughs> Oh yes, sorry. The other meta question is, yeah, sorry. The other meta question is you need examples. Okay. It's pretty oh, it's, life's pretty uh, arid if you just go through life thinking about definitions. Okay, you need examples. You need to be sure you're actually talking about something that has some solid platonic existence, something that people ought to be interested in. Like these things, but that's the point of referring to the really natural groups of life. You should be able to say something about the natural groups. But you should also not be proving theorems about a new definition if you don't know that the new definition gives you something, encompasses something the old definitions did. Okay? So you need, in particular, so it's, so it's got two aspects to it. Right? So the first aspect is to sort of include groups of classical interest. <laughs> and the second aspect is you need examples, you need constructions of groups that distinguish between different classes that discriminate. What I mean, what, I, what I'm having in mind is you can take nice theorems, you can start weakening the hypotheses and prove the theorems are true, but it, it's not worth doing unless you're actually genuinely enlarging the class of groups. Okay, so you, you really have to, sooner or later you have to face up to this and you have to prove that you have to prove that there are groups which are in one that make, that make the class that's a priori possibly bigger, really bigger, and you want counterexamples. Okay, so and the counter example. I want to be able to prove that 
there are groups that have are excluded by interesting definitions. Okay. So I think that's all I want to say about my universal groups. Okay, we're exploring them here. And I was hoping very much to spend quite a bit of time by preparing backwards to talk about subgroups. Okay? I'm constantly fascinated by the question. Okay. So given the class of groups. class of groups, uh, uh, what are the finite presented? It's always right that finite presented, finite general, it's easy. Uh, subgroups. Okay, so if you <coughs> take a class of groups and then say, okay, we'll take that class of groups and now think of all the groups that are finitely presented, subgroups of those guys. How, how does that differ from the big class? How much is that an enlargement of the class you're thinking about? And it's a, it's a kind of, well, I think it's an interesting observation about the universe that on this side of the universe, the amenable side of the universe, you take any of those <coughs> classes and you take a